I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. Why bats? I mean, what's the point? How useful are they to us? Rodrigo Medellin says society has grossly misunderstood how very much we need them. Medellin is a bat expert at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. People living north of the Rio Grande, he says, really ought to learn about a species known as the Mexican free tail bat. Each million bats of this one species destroys 10 tons of insects every night. This same species, you guys have it in the United States all the way up to the center of the U.S. By the end of this episode, we hope you'll deeply appreciate how important bats are to our own health and prosperity. But more than just that, we want you to catch some of the infectious enthusiasm for these creatures that Rodrigo Medellin seems unable to suppress. It's easy to understand how the Batman of Mexico got his nickname. I'm never happier than when I'm in the field with a new group of students and I put their first bat in their hands, looking at the different features, the eyes, the ears, the nose, touching the skin, touching the wings. It's incredible. If you have your doubts that stroking a bat qualifies as an experience devoutly to be desired, let me be quick to emphasize that Professor Medellin comes with decades of hands-on encounters with these furry-winged mammals. This goes clear back to his teen years. I don't recommend that you ever try what he did back then, keeping vampire bats in his bathroom and feeding them his own blood. The bathroom looked like a Hitchcock movie. We'll get back to his bats in the bathroom story, but first let's take a moment to recall how these animals got such a bad rap generally. In large measure, it had to do with our horror movies. In all of the annals of mystery, there's never been a more elusive, fearsome, and cunning killer. But nobody lives forever, so why be afraid of the bat? What Hollywood skips right over is the centuries-old backstory that fed into our modern bat terror at the cinema. Here's Professor Medellin's explanation of how Europeans acquired bat fear. Going back 400 and some years to the times when the conquistadors finally landed on the coast of what is today the state of Tabasco in the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, of course, they find an entirely new universe for them. Everything was weird. Everything was strange. They had never been in a tropical system like that. And then among the soldiers that Cortés brought with him was this incredible scribe, Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo, who had a keen eye for the natural world. He found out that when they were bringing the horses down from the ships, and they were spending their first night uh, right on the coast, they saw these little things flying at night, landing on the horses, landing on the soldiers, and biting them and feeding on their blood. And that is the stuff of nightmares, seriously. But that's what he said. He did not use the word bat. He did not use the word vampire or anything like that. He just said, there's these little things that fly at night, that land on the horses, land on the soldiers, and bite them for the blood. That's what he said. Now, we're going to have to go back a little further, Marcus, and go to the Middle Ages, in which the word vampir had its origin in Central Europe in the Serbian area, and the word vampir referred to a human being that was dead, but that would wake up in the evenings and would be looking out for young people to suck on their blood. 
There was absolutely zero connection to a bat. It was a human being, vampire. All right. So then this episode happens with Cortes and his scribes and his soldiers. And then that stays there. And then uh, about 360 years later in Ireland, we have this incredible writer, Bram Stoker, who is writing this amazing novel called Dracula. That I really love Dracula, you know, the, the, the story is incredible. Bram Stoker is a history buff, and he has this problem that his Dracula, his vampire, has to move very long distances very fast. And he remembers that there was this anecdote in a Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo's Chronicles, and he says, I know what my vampire is going to do. He is going to turn into a bat and then fly long distances and then turn back into a man and then bite the girl. That is the moment, Marcus, when the public image of bats comes crashing down to the ground and everybody starts thinking of them as the envoys of the devil and everything bad and everything filthy and everything ugly, etc. And this is why we're here. Yeah, so what you're telling me is that this whole vampire bat thing, the story of it all, is a concoction that was devised to entertain people. Exactly. Today we know that there is more than 1,400 species of bats in the world. From those 1,400 species, only three feed on blood. And those three live in Latin America. They do not live anywhere else. There's no vampire bats in Africa. There's no vampire bats in Asia anywhere else. And of course, they're an incredible creation of evolution. You know, how can any, any animal survive on just blood? Even mosquitoes feed on other things more than blood. The female mosquitoes need to feed on blood in order for them to produce lots and lots of eggs. But their primary source of food is nectar from flowers. More innocent than that, impossible. Well, nobody tells that story about mosquitoes and nobody seems to want to tell the good stories about bats. We get all excited and nervous and anxious about the, the blood stuff. Uh, have you ever been bitten? We have to um, play a little bit with the word bitten. Vampire bats can bite you for food or vampire bats can bite you for defense. I have never been bitten for food but I have been bitten for defense. Well, I have to confess here, you, you don't look very tasty to me. <laughs> well, let me tell you, never bitten for food, many times bitten for defense. However, my blood has ended up in the gut of some vampire bats. So then out now with your story of keeping bats right at home. When I was a kid way back 50 something years, I had a group of vampire bats living in the family bathroom here in Mexico City. With parental permission? With parental permission, I have to say. My parents were the most amazing and patient and understanding human beings on earth. They were incredible. They would let me have anything from rattlesnakes to tarantulas to scorpions to bats of every kind. Uh, ringtail cats, so many things. I basically took over the, the bathroom that I shared with my siblings, and I had seven vampire bats living there. In um, cages? No, they were just flying freely in the bathroom. So I had them because I was studying some behavioral stuff when I was like 15 or 16. And to do that, you have to keep them alive. To do that, I went to the vet school of the University of Mexico and asked my friends there to let me bleed cows from this vein that the cows have down their bellies. And then as the blood comes out, you whip it with your hand in a bucket. That makes fibrin, which is the protein that makes blood coagulate, to collect in little little rubber bands that float, you remove those rubber bands and you have perfectly defibrinated, uncoagulating blood. 
I brought it back to home. I took my mom's ice cube trays from the freezer, removed the ice cubes and replaced it with blood, put it back into the freezer, and then I would thaw one little ice cube of blood per vampire per night. My vampires are alive and well. But of course, when they land on the blood, the blood spills all over the place. So the bathroom looked like a Hitchcock movie, you know. You can imagine. Um, <laughs> but then I ran out of blood. And my sister was studying medicine at the time. So I asked her to please bleed me a little bit because I needed five more days of observations on the vampire bats. So she bled me, we defibrinated the blood and we fed the vampire bats my own blood. Okay, there's a story before this story, and it has to do with your first point of entree into the study of bats. And actually, we have to talk about mammals, generally speaking, because as a very young child, were you, were you hanging out with the encyclopedias and opening them up and just going to the mammals section? I was just crazy for the natural world from day one, really. Every kind of animal, every type of natural system would really capture my attention. My first word, Marcus, was not mama or dada or doodoo. My first word was flamingo. And my mom wrote it down in the baby book saying, little Rodrigo said his first word today, he was pointing at a picture of a flamingo and he said ganglingo or something like that. And then I started growing up and every Christmas, every birthday, what I would want is to have a new book on animals or go to the zoo or go to the field to see animals. All my life was like that. So when I was 12 years old, there was this uh, TV contest in national TV in Mexico uh, called the 64,000 peso contest. And this 64,000 peso contest is something in which you choose a topic and they ask questions on that topic and they double the amount of pesos that you get every time you answer correctly until you get to 64,000. So we were watching this show because it was an amazing show really. And I told my mom that I wanted to appear there and that I could answer anything they could ask about mammals. I have to tell you, Marcus, at that time, there was nobody in Mexico that knew more about African mammals than myself. I was going crazy for African mammals. Okay. And my mom said, well, why don't you just go and play? You're a child. You're not into this. Look at this man. He's being asked questions about Mahler's music. What do you want to do with mammals on that show? Go play. And I kept insisting and insisting over two or three weeks saying, Mom, I want to be there. I want to appear there. I can answer questions. Please take me. So, yes, my mom was very, very, very understanding, very patient, and she took me to the producers. The producers said, no, no, no. This is a show for adult people who have real information in their heads. And she said, well, ask the kid a question and see if he has any information. So they pulled out a book. They started asking questions and I started responding, responding, responding. Pretty soon they said, well, congratulations. You're the first kid in the show. And then uh, I started appearing every Saturday at 7 p.m. This is prime time. And there's all of three channels in Mexican TV. So everyone is watching. Everyone is watching, including the Dean of Mexican Mammalogy, Professor Bernardo Villa. And Professor Villa saw me and he said, I need to contact this kid. He called the station, station gave him my phone number and he called me and he said, well, I see that you're interested in mammals. How about you come to the University of Mexico and we will take you to the field to see the animals that you really like and enjoy and etc." So that was a dream come true for a 12 year old like myself. I started going there and pretty soon some of the professors started taking me to the field with them. And then about a year later, they finally put the first bat in my hands and that sealed my fate. The first cave that I went into with the professors and the first bat that they gave me is the California leaf nose bat. It's an amazing animal with humongous ears, really personable animal. He didn't even try to bite me or anything. He was just sitting in my hand, uh, waiting patiently to be examined. 
And once I looked at it and the professor started asking questions about it, what do you think it eats? Where do you think it lives? Why does it have those big ears and so on? My mind was wrapped around how flimsy they look, but how sturdy they really are how powerful the wings are because they were always fighting, trying to get rid of my hand and fly away. I measured the forearm of the bat, I weighed it, and then I let it go. And the feeling of releasing that bat from my hand into the wild was exhilarating. Part of my spirit went up with that bat it was so amazing. I can still see that scene of the bat flying out of my hand and just smile. I can't help it. I just smile. I don't imagine that at age 11 that I would have opened up my hand to receive a bat. I, don't, I just don't see myself doing that. I'm sorry, Marcus, but I can see you and I can see every 11-year-old child in the world doing this. Just give them the benefit of the doubt. One tiny little window into the bad world and you will be blown away. There's so many aspects of them that connect them to us, to our everyday lives. I've seen it many times, child or not, adult or not. You, you show them their first bat and their eyes become, oh my God, I never expected this. And that really touches their soul. It's an internal experience that I really wish everyone could have. Okay, a couple of things here. First of all, were you wearing gloves? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I was not only wearing gloves, I was also vaccinated against rabies. Bats are mammals and like other mammals, like foxes and bobcats and coyotes and many mammals can suffer rabies. The percentage of bats that carry rabies is really tiny. We have demonstrated it time and again. Less than 1% of the bats carry the virus, but rabies is rabies and you cannot run any risks. So I was vaccinated and I had my gloves with me, etc. But having it in your hand, looking at the different features, the eyes, the ears, the nose, everything is really amazing. Touching the skin, touching the wings, it's incredible. So you've got the bat in your gloved hand. How are you holding it? Is it belly up? Is it belly down? Are you putting your hands on the wings to keep them from flapping? What are you doing? It's a very easy and very natural process, actually. I mean, if I give it to one of my new students, they will comfortably get into the mode of holding a bat. You basically put the chest of the bat against your four fingers and put your thumb on the back of the bat and the head is out. You can look at the head, you look at the face, you can look at the ears and everything. And you can, with your other hand, you can stretch a wing and look at all of the bones in the wing, look at the colors and everything. So it's a very easy and straightforward way to do it with a gloved hand. I continue to be that same 12-year-old that I was 50-something years ago. And even today, right now, if someone walks in that door with a bat in their hands, I am going to forget about this interview, and I'm going to focus <laughs> on that bat. This has happened to me before. I mean, I have described myself as one of the happiest people I know, and I'm never happier than when I'm in the field with a new group of students and I put their first bat in their hands and I look into their eyes and I see myself. I see myself once again over and over, over and over. And their eyes go crazy and they really are absorbing every little feature of the bat. Would I be saying too much to read you as the type of person who found, if I can use the word, you found a calling in life. That is exactly right. And in that sense, it's a little difficult for me when I hear young people asking for advice uh, and they say, I don't know what to study, whether I should go into engineering or into medical sciences. 
because I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was 12 or 13. It was a very clear calling. It's not a very common calling, although as time passes, I'm finding more and more children that are clear scientists in their minds, and I'm doing everything in my power to continue promoting their scientific spirit inside of them. I mean, sometimes I feel like I have this deformity in my mind. I'm just so in awe with the natural world. It just gives me so much energy, so much love, so much passion for the world. That I call a calling. I've never held a bat, but Professor Medellin's description of what it's like reminds me, strangely, of the first time I held a chicken, which wasn't until I was all grown up. And chickens have wings, so I think this is fair. But when I picked up a chicken, I realized that it's not the delicate creature that you think it is just from seeing those feathers. A chicken is a sturdy thing, and you can feel the heartbeat. And I asked Rodrigo Medellin if feeling the heartbeat of a bat is part of the spark for him. Absolutely, absolutely. You feel the heart beating, I don't know, it's like 10 times a second or something like that. You feel them fidgeting constantly, trying to free themselves. You feel their warmth. I mean, chickens are kind of isolated from the outside world by the feathers. And the feathers may do a very good job isolating their temperature, unless they're a very, very small sparrow or things like that. In in bats, you feel the warmth. You immediately feel how warm they are. And the warmth goes through your glove and into your hand. You feel the chest beating, the heart beating. And when you spread the wing, you see the veins going through and feeding that membrane. So it's a very, very alive thing that you're holding. And I can't help but just uh, wonder how this came to be more than 1,400 species around the world. It's really something to be in awe. Now, is the experience contingent upon the wildness of that creature. I'm wondering if the the natural context somehow also played a part. Most definitely. It was inside a cave that I sometimes go back to and I relive all of the feelings that I felt when I had that first bat in my hand. So yes, it does have a lot to do with the contact with the natural world. And Marcus here, I think it's an important thing that we have to highlight here that uh, human beings today are beginning to detach themselves from the natural world that we belong to, that we are part of. You see children that spend 10 times more time in an iPad or an iPhone or whatever, and rarely are they ever allowed to play in the mud, to take earthworms and roll them in their hands or pill bugs or sea animals in the wild. And this is, I think, absolutely crucial for our own survival, for our own well-being, for our own happiness, but also for the connection with the rest of the world. Talk to me more about children and what you have seen, because I know that in the field, you're probably also having the opportunity to find the young Rodrigos like yourself, like the person you were. And you're the professor, I would imagine, that has an open door for the youth. Absolutely. I use every opportunity that I have to go to the field with young people. This is exactly the kind of thing that keeps me alive, Marcus. I mean, I can describe myself as a kind of uh, an intellectual vampire. I thrive exchanging ideas with the youth. So, for example, one time, one of the kids looking at the feet of the bat, he said, why do you think they didn't develop wings in their feet and they only develop wings in their arms? I started thinking and I said, well... It may be because they needed to hang from the roof of the caves and they need those little feet with those little claws to hang from them. And then he said, and why can't they just hang from their thumbs or be upright like us? And I've been thinking on on the answer to that question ever since. That fuel my interest and my curiosity about continuing to do research on these things.
We do take children to the field. We run bat nights here in Mexico City. Here in the city, we have more than 20 species of bats. We run sessions with bat detectors that you can attach to your smartphone. And you just go out in a park or whatever, and you see bats flying around. And the kids are always really excited to see them flying out there. But of course, they want to see it up close. And sometimes we set up a misnet and we catch some bats and we show them to children there. And those children will never forget. And I have seen this, Marcus. I mean, some of those children are coming back to the University of Mexico studying biology and they want to come back and study bats. Rodrigo Medellin's influence goes far beyond the youth though they may be the most important people he's reaching out to and mentoring today. In just a moment, we'll hear how he has opened eyes to the bat-agave relationship. It's a phenomenon with huge implications for cosmetics, sweeteners, shampoos, detergents, tequila, medicines, and even biofuels. Most of us, as we grow into adults, we are taught an aversion to bats. We are taught to be fearful. We're taught to be cautious. We're taught that they are pests, that they carry disease. I'm wondering if you have been able to take somebody like that who's, who's had that acculturation to despise bats. Have you brought somebody around? You give me any type of audience, whether kindergartners or senators, And many times there's not much of a difference between kindergartners and senators. (laughs) And and that is really not fair to the children. (laughs) Seriously, you know. Uh, But you give me any audience, 15 minutes, 20 minutes with them, and I will turn them around. I give them the facts. I give them the evidence. I give them the images. And in a flash, they have become bad defenders. I have done that many, many times. Even with the mayor of Mexico City a few years ago, I did it. And now there is a big colony of bats living in the office of the mayor of Mexico City, and she's keeping them there for good measure. Where are they kept exactly? Her office is in a very old building, downtown Mexico City, very, very old. And in between the different layers of the roof, that's where the bats are. You see them coming out. It's about 5,000 bats. You can see them coming out every evening with the big lights of the cathedral and everything. And of course, all of the bugs are flying around the lights and everything, and the bats are zooming in and eating all of those bugs. Well, what contributed to the mayor's change of heart? Why did she come around? I told her about how important they are and what connections they have to our everyday lives. As you said a minute ago, Marcus, bats are maligned in many cultures, not all the cultures, but many cultures. Even in Mexico, in in pre-Columbian times, bats had a very positive image and they had a very close connection with times of wealth, times of happiness, times of celebration, etc. And the same thing happens in China, same thing happens in India, in the Incas in South America, and so on and so forth. But with this unfortunate situation with the vampire bats and Dracula, everything came crashing down. But let's go to the basics. What is it that we get day in and day out from bats and we never realize? You're about to talk about ecosystem services, probably. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, I try to avoid technical terms like that so that people don't get distracted. Oh, no, what? He's going to talk about equations. No, no, I'm not going to talk about (laughs) equations at all. So think for a second that just in the northern fringe of Mexico, the Mexican states that border with the United States, from the state of Sonora to the state of Tamaulipas, There, we have estimated that we have between 20 and 30 million bats of one species, the Mexican free-tailed bat. Each million bats of this one species destroys 10 tons of insects every night. This same species, you guys have it in the United States all 
the way up to the center of the U.S. Oklahoma, Colorado, all of those states have those bats in the summer. These bats are migratory. They spend the winter here in Mexico and the summer in northern Mexico and the southern half of the United States. You just touched on something very important. We have the poster child of migration called the monarch butterfly. People talk about that all the time, going down to Mexico, coming back. But nobody talks about bat migration like that. Exactly, exactly my point. I mean, not only bats migrate between our two countries, they connect us both. We are indelibly connected. But it's also true that that ecosystem services pest control For example, about one third of the corn that is produced in your corn belt is due to these bats defending, protecting that corn from pests. But that service depends on us protecting those bats in the winter when they're down here. And when we have them here and they're protecting our crops, we depend on your efforts in the United States to protect those caves and those bats when they are there in the summer. So we are reciprocally connected. We depend on each other for good or bad. Would you talk to me about the commercial value of bats, not just protecting corn crops, but there's quite a story about the agave and your role in advocating and convincing the farmers to change their ways. That is another one of these incredible services that touch every day of our lives. From 140 species of bats that we have here in Mexico, about 14, 10% feed on the nectar and pollen of many different plants that are ecologically or economically important. Some of them, if you watch a Western movie and you remember those incredible columnar cactuses, these giant cactuses, spectacular plants from the West of your country, please remember that those cactuses are pollinated by bats. We wouldn't have them if it was not for the bats. But that is only one type of plant. Now, the Ceiba tree, which is the sacred tree for the Maya Indians here in my country, is one of the biggest trees in my country, about 60 meters tall. That's 180 feet tall. And it is pollinated by bats. And then what can I say as a Mexican, Marcus? You know, part of our identity connects with agave because agave are some of the most useful plants. We use it for food, we use it for fiber, we use it to cook, we use it to drink. Pulque, tequila, mezcal, all of those things come from agaves. And agaves are pollinated by bats. Agaves and bats have been linked for more than 10 million years and they're intricately connected Agaves rely on bats to carry out pollination and bats rely on agaves to feed, to survive. So imagine, that is just the second ecosystem service. The third ecosystem service is seed dispersal. If you come to Mexico at this time and throughout the summer, you are going to find a great variety of fruits, local fruits that we harvest from our forests, from our deserts, from our grasslands, etc., that are dispersed by bats. Even the tropical rainforests of all of Latin America depend on bats for their seed dispersal. It's actually bats that trigger the recovery of the forest. Once humans have come and chopped the forest, the first plants to grow back are the pioneer plants that are there because bats have been dispersing those seeds for generations. Would I be right in guessing that the seeds pass through their digestive tract? If the seeds are small enough, they do pass through the digestive tract of the bats and then the bats are flying and they defecate on the wing and there go the seeds. But there's also large seeded plants from sapotes to guavas to other things that do not go through the digestive tract and they still carry the fruit to another place where they're going to eat the pulp and drop the seed. There's dispersal. Now, I I would like to go back to agave for a moment here because there is something really... It's science but I think it's really interesting in terms of the practices of the farmers in producing agave and how uh, those practices would chop off the rare flower stalks. Exactly. You know, agaves have this incredible reproductive mode in which they 
grow for many years, accumulating sugars every year, year after year, until the time comes when they are mature for sexual reproduction. At that time, they invest every last ounce of those sugars that they have accumulated over 6, 8, 10, 20, 30 years, depending on the species, into one single flowering stock, one single reproductive event, sexual reproductive event in which they are going to open their arms and offer their flowers to the pollinators, the bats, and then that is where the seeds come from. And then this is such a costly process for the plant that we call that a suicide mode of reproduction. They invest every last ounce into this one sexual reproduction event and then they die. That's it. That's it. But humans have learned that if we harvest them just before they start growing the flowering stock, we maximize the amount of sugars in the plant and therefore we maximize the amount of alcohol that we can extract. And we can still replant our fields with the baby agaves that are clonal shoots, exact genetic copies that grow under the parent plant. So I'm guessing the bats derive no benefit whatsoever from the agave through the cloning, the asexual reproduction. Exactly. There's absolutely zero benefits for the bats. Well, there's a little bit of a benefit for the agaves because they at least replace themselves in the system, but they have lost the possibility of exchanging genes, continuing evolution, continuing building their own resistance to diseases, to climate change, to pesticides, etc., etc., etc. So they really need that exchange of genes, that pollination. But humans have done that in the case of tequila for 150 years. In those 150 years, the agaves have gone through a bottleneck every, every six to eight years with the result that today we have about 270 million plants of agave tequilana, the tequila agave, that are clones of a handful of plants. Less than 10 plants are represented there. As soon as you say the word clone, it makes me think of the vulnerability of something like the Cavendish banana. That's our main banana variety on the market today. It's a clone and could go commercially extinct because it's so susceptible to disease. It has to do with the way we've monocultured it. And I hear you saying that the agave is in a, a similar situation of vulnerability. Exactly the same thing. Yeah. And so the vulnerability there as it relates to farmers, you got involved. And the story, as I understand it, is you went and made a case and they patted you on the head and said nice information and then sent you out the door and that was that. Oh, yeah. This is a long time ago. 1994 was the first time that I went to visit the Tequila Regulatory Council. And I told them about this. I told them they had to start investing in their partners, the bats, if they wanted to save their, their business. And they said, oh, fascinating. Thank you for coming, Dr. Mejin. Bye bye. Bye. And then a friend of mine published a paper in 2004 showing that those 270 million plants are just clones of a handful of plants. And then I went back there to them and I said, guys, all it takes is for one disease to hit one plant and all of your plants are going to be sick because they're all the same. Oh, wow. Thank you very much for warning us, Dr. Medellin. Thank you. Bye bye. And that was it. And then about six or seven years later, the disease shows up. I swear, Marcos, it was not me. <laughs> okay. Uh, but then they call me and they said, what was that thing you were saying about the bats and the flowers and the agave? I said, well, okay, we're late, but let's see what we can do. And then we started the Bat Friendly Tequila and Mezcal program that is still growing and it's, it's going well. I mean, everybody wants to be part of it in which we ask the farmers to allow only 5% of the plants in any field to flower. And that will feed a handful of bats. But this is one farmer, another farmer, another farmer, another farmer. And with that, you use the remaining 95% to produce your tequila, your mezcal, etc. And then the University of Mexico will give you this label that goes on the bottle that says this is a bat-friendly tequila or bat-friendly mezcal. And that goes to the consumer. It's actually the consumer that is driving the process. The consumers are vested on saving the plants, saving the bats, and saving their beverage. So hang on, if 
consumers are recognizing that bats are worth saving. Does that mean that we're getting over the stereotype of bats as dirty pests and something to be terrified of? I think we've made quite a bit of progress, Marcus, in the sense of improving the public image of bats. Today, uh, people know that bats are not the devil's, the, the devil's envoys or the filthy animals that are going to bring us all kinds of diseases or anything like that. They know, people know that a good chunk of our well-being, of our everyday life, from your cotton shirt that you're wearing right now to the taco that you're going to eat at dinner, and that's connected to bats. Okay, I am in fact wearing a part cotton, part polyester shirt. What is the <laughs> bat connection to my shirt? Bats, again, are protecting the crop of, of cotton. And even when today most of the cotton is produced in China, Texas and northern Mexico used to produce a lot of cotton. Today, we've demonstrated that about 20% of the cotton is there because bats are protecting the crop from a little moth that eats the cotton ball. So we replicated this in China and it's the same thing, the same thing. Bats are protecting massive cotton fields in China, same way. After decades in one focused line of work, some professionals get jaded, not Medellin. Nor does he want us to become complacent about things like a link of cause and effect between bats and cotton. I learn about such things and suddenly it matters to me. Who knew that the very cotton I routinely need and wear would factor into this episode on bats? You're listening to Constant Wonder. The BBC filmed Rodrigo Medellin as he watched, with his very own eyes for his very first time in real time, the drama of a baby bat being born. How can you even see such a thing in a pitch black cave? We had set up cameras with infrared light with the pregnant mothers that were giving birth by the hundreds every night. In the BBC documentary, Go and Google it. It's called Natural World, The Batman of Mexico. You can actually see a mother bat hanging upside down, giving birth to a slippery little thing that she has to catch before it falls. Here's Rodrigo's reaction as he witnessed this. <laughs> no es posible. The baby's coming out. Guacolo. That was the first time, Marcus, that I saw a baby being born. I mean, I've seen many babies, many very young babies with an umbilical cord attached and everything. But the moment of the birth, I had never seen before. And my reaction was just like my reaction before any wonder of the world. With all our potential care and concern and engagement with such wonders, we're not suggesting that something like a bat can't be dangerous. Early European arrivals in the New World quickly learned about that. And any animal, we all know, can transmit disease. Malaria from mosquitoes, rabies from raccoons. The possibilities are endless. Bats came under intense scrutiny as COVID started racing around the world in 2020. And you can bet that Professor Medellin was watching all the finger pointing going on. I saw that from the very beginning. And there's a number of elements here, Marcus, that we have to touch lightly on. Unfortunately, there are individuals in the world who have found that uh, by using the negative uh, public image of bats, they can scare institutions, they can scare authorities, they can scare the government into giving them money to study the diseases that these animals are bringing to us. But from the very first moment when they blame bats, we knew exactly that that was not the case at all. Today, we know that bats are completely innocent and that there are two primary hypotheses to explain COVID. One is that it came from different types of animals, not a bat, 
different types of animals that were piled up in cages in this market where they were defecating and urinating and salivating on top of each other. And that is a perfect fertile grounds for new exchanges between different viruses. But there was no bat connected there. There was absolutely zero bats there, especially because in Wuhan, they do not touch bats. They do not feed them. They do not eat bats at all. And then the other one is that there was this lab in Wuhan that was doing this research called gain of function, which is a very tricky and very dangerous research to do. Basically, you take a virus and you start playing with it, playing with its genome, with the genetic material to make it more aggressive, more dangerous, more pathogenic, more resistant. Why do you want to do that kind of research? And on top of that, they were doing that research in a biosafety level two. When you're playing with viruses like that, you have to have biosafety level four with hazmat suits and vacuum belts and all kinds of things to avoid escaping. Level two biosafety is your dentist's office. So of course, it could have escaped from there. So those are the two theories that are most accepted and being still studied around the world. We're still waiting for China to release some additional data from the very first patients there, but it hasn't happened. What I hear you saying is that bats were collateral damage in these stories that were swirling around. And unfortunately, it's very easy to make bats a collateral damage because if I tell you the Secretary of Health or whatever, oh, you know, there's another pandemic coming. And if we don't pay attention to bats, bats are going to spread this new virus or new bacteria or whatever. And we're going to be in very deep water. So why don't you give me money and I will study that and I will prevent that from happening. That has happened many times. I have very good friends around the world who have been offered to add a zero to their budget if they look and harvest and collect new viruses of bats. People around the world, terrified of COVID, started exterminating bats, attempting to drive them out of town with water cannons in Rwanda or torching them with fire in Cuba, just to name two examples. Rodrigo Medellin and his colleagues acted quickly. So we reached out to everyone, and the IUCN Bat Specialist Group has been working day in and day out to provide the elements to show that bats are not the culprits. So we actually effectively stopped the killing of bats in Rwanda, in Cuba, in Bolivia, in Costa Rica, in Colombia, and many other countries, because we just provided information and they just took it to the authorities and the authorities realized that. The fear that bats or any creatures are vectors of disease, that fear can keep us from interacting with animals or soil or plants, maybe even from ever venturing outside in the first place. If you haven't been relieved of some of that anxiety or inspired by the enthusiasm that Rodrigo Medellin has for the natural world, listen to him now making one last plea for you to rethink things. When was the last time that each of your listeners went out to the local forest, to the local park, and just sat and just be there with nature? and just absorb the silence, if it's the winter, or the buzzing of the insects and the chirping of the birds around you. When was the last time you did something like that? Well, this is exactly what happens to me when I go in a cave. The silence and the peace and the quiet in those caves is unsurpassed by any other experience. Every time I go to a cave, I make a point of sending the students back out. Okay, guys, go, go, and I'll catch up with you. And then I stay behind for only five minutes, sitting down, eyes closed, absorbing and enjoying the peace and the darkness and the quiet. It's all part of the natural world. And I'm just being, I'm just contemplating myself. 
absorbing everything around me. My mind is not racing, oh, I have to read this, I have to submit this paper, I have to submit this proposal. No, nothing like that is in my mind. You can go into your closet and do the same thing. Isolate yourself. Your mom is calling you for dinner. Okay, wait. Just be there with yourself. Nobody but yourself. And enjoying that peace, that darkness, that isolation, that honing of your ears, which is the only sense that really works in the darkness of the cave. It's an amazing thing that I recommend that everyone uh, enjoys at least once in their lifetime. Is there any wonder in this world that for you personally is comparable to having that first bat in your hand when you were a boy? <sighs> wow. It's, it's hard because I'm, I'm in awe with everything. But really the way it touched my spirit and the way I remember it and the way I renew it, every time I have a bat in my hand, I don't think there's anything like it. If I go to Africa and I see uh, a group of elephants playing, I am there in the same space. But it doesn't move me as much as having a bat in my hand. If you were transformed holding that bat as a young boy, what were you before and what were you after? I have always been very passionate about the natural world. But I was going in many different directions. And that bat gave me focus. And that focus has remained over decades. If I had not been on TV, I don't even know if I would have been a, a biologist because being on TV pulled me in the direction of the University of Mexico, of these people who study mammals here, and that put me on the right track. Otherwise, it would have been interpreted as, oh yeah, that's his hobby. The young kids, when they express interest in the natural world, and we don't nurture that, and we just say, oh yeah, he, he's funny, he knows all the names of the dinosaurs and things like that. Keep nurturing that. Every human being from day one, we're scientists. A toddler that is dropping things from the table, he's studying gravity. He's learning how the world works. We are all scientists. All I ask is that we continue nurturing that little scientist that we have inside. Rodrigo Medellin has been our guest today. He's a professor of ecology at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. This episode was produced by Tenery Taylor with help from Audrey Hughes and Brian Barba, sound designed by Dallin Jepson. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.